Okay, I think we will start now. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Web as a Cafe uh, online networking event for visual art professionals. Um, this is part of the alteration program, and my name is Oleksandr Vinogradov. Uh, I am head of visual art at the Ukrainian Institute. So today we're going to talk uh, about the ways we can use web as an online networking tool, but also, and perhaps even more importantly, uh, we will talk about the ways that we can inhabit uh, this digital environment, uh, making it uh, a place for um, meaningful exchange uh, in the months uh, to come. So today uh, you're going to hear presentations about uh, art institutions and individuals uh, coping with the challenges of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, and uh, carrying out projects uh, in this new reality, which we almost uh, got used to. Uh, we will also have uh, Q&As, uh, discussions uh, and networking sessions, and we really hope uh, to have an honest, frank, and uh, easygoing uh, conversation between colleagues uh, about the experiences uh, of art professionals today. We really don't want this event to be too formal, so I invite you all uh, to make yourself comfortable, uh, grab a cup of coffee, um, iced tea, or uh, any drink of your choice uh, at this time of day uh, in June. Uh, and enjoy your time in our cafe. Uh, and uh, right now, it is my pleasure to uh, invite here to this stage uh, my colleague, uh, Irina Prokofieva, who is the program director of the Ukrainian Institute, uh, for a welcome word. So, Irina, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am really happy that we are having this event, uh, which is taking place in the framework of the alteration program, which Alexander have, has already mentioned. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the program itself. Uh, the alteration program is uh, a, ser a series of online events for professionals of the cultural sphere and civil society sphere and it's dedicated to uh, find discuss and find uh, and define new ways uh, efficient ways of establishing meaningful connections between uh, actors of cultural sphere and civil society from ukraine and the european union and this program uh, already had uh, events for uh, music industry for uh, civil society organizations um, for uh, it's it's also going to uh, we are also going to have one more event uh, for performing arts uh, we have already been talking uh, to colleagues uh, from um, other industries and um, uh, this program is actually taking place uh, under the cultural relations platform which is also a EU fund the EU funded program and the Ukrainian Institute is implementing uh, the alteration program together with the European Union delegation to Ukraine. We are also happy to have our uh, technical partners, uh, which is Digitizing Space, uh, the team of professionals uh, who help us to make this uh, digital experience uh, smooth and comfortable. Uh, so in case you have any technical uh, questions or you have any challenges with the platform, you can always uh, approach our technical support team and write your question or request in the event chat. Uh, let me also mention that we are going to have the closing event of the alteration program um, on, uh, on the 8th of July. And this will be a, a cross-sectoral event, uh, which may be of interest for any kind of professional from the cultural sphere. So let me invite you to this event. This will be an online conference where we are going to talk about uh, how to manage our projects and organizations in times of uh, uncertainty, uh, which frameworks and approaches and methodologies we can use to uh, manage our institutions uh, in crisis. Uh, how to do it efficiently and uh, what type of leadership we uh, should develop uh, in times of crisis and uncertainty. So uh, let me invite you. Uh, I think this will be a very interesting event. 
And one more thing that we are doing uh, under the alteration program is that we are creating the handbook of project models uh, from different parts of the world, showcasing uh, institutions and teams and initiatives that uh, had some interesting approach during the last year towards their uh, ideas and projects and activities. So uh, we will have the handbook of interesting cases, both from Ukraine and the European Union countries, about how uh, different project models were adapted uh, to the pandemic situation, to online uh, formats, and etc. So we hope that this handbook will be um, uh, a useful source of uh, both uh, inspiration and uh, good case uh, practice uh, for you. So we are going to present this handbook uh, also on the 8th of July uh, during our closing event. So let me also invite you to uh, to be in touch with us and stay tuned and uh, check our handbook as soon as it's published uh, online. Um, thank you for your time and being here with us today. I wish you to have a meaningful day and we will, uh, we are, I'm not saying goodbye because I still will be with you today uh, uh, and tomorrow, but I wish you an exciting experience uh, on these two days. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. And uh, I guess it's time for us to talk a little bit about our today's program. So we start with a keynote uh, by Alexandra Janus, who I will introduce in a few moments. Um, by the way, I hope that you uh, have the program that I sent you uh, a couple of days ago uh, via mail, but you can also check uh, the program at any time uh, here in Hopin. Uh, but le let's just have a glance at it right now to know what we should be prepared for. So after Alexandra Janos's uh, keynote, uh, we will have uh, a getting to know each other. This is going to be our first uh, networking session. Uh, it takes place at 11.30 key of time, and I really hope that as many people as possible will be able to uh, attend. Uh, it will be followed by uh, the first uh, case presentation by uh, Daria Mille of uh, CKM uh, at 12.30 key of time. Uh, we will then have a lunch break of 50 minutes uh, and get back together at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, key of time for the presentation uh, by artist and researcher Emily Hudeman. Uh, after that, at uh, 2.40 key of time, uh, we'll have our speed dating session one. Uh, you will have uh, five minutes to talk to each of the participants and we have prepared some icebreaker questions for you to have fun with. Uh, after this networking, uh, we will gather for the final uh, presentation by Alexia Hileos, uh, Ostap Manulak, and Marinos Kutsomihalis at uh, 3.20 Kyiv time. And this will be followed by the final speed dating session. Uh, and at 4.30, I will briefly explain what we are going to do tomorrow. Uh, in case you never used Hopin before, uh, to your right, uh, there is a comment section. Uh, there are several tabs uh, in that comment section. You can comment uh, through, throughout the whole event, uh, or you can post uh, messages in the stage chat. Basically, it doesn't really matter. So uh, we just invite you to use any chat uh, that you find uh, comfortable for you. And this way, we will be able to uh, communicate throughout the event. Uh, and on the panel to your left, uh, you see a stage, a sessions, and networking. So we are currently uh, on the stage, but we'll later move to the sessions. Uh, and in the afternoon, uh, you will be using networking as well. I will explain to you how to use them along the way, so uh, don't worry. And now let's move on with our program. And it is now my pleasure to invite to the stage uh, Alexandra Janus, who will present a keynote titled Towards a Post-Pandemic Future, Imagining New Realities of Cultural Institutions. 
Alexandra Janos uh, is a researcher, activist, and curator of cultural programs. She holds a PhD in anthropology and is the head of the Open Culture Studio and co-director of Centrum Zifrova. Uh, she co-founded several cultural initiatives, including Museum Lab, a training program for Polish cultural professionals, and more recently, a working group Museums for Climate and Culture for Climate Initiative. She is also a co-curator of Exercising Modernity Academy. In her work, she focuses on digital transformation in the arts and cultural sector, as well as on how technology changes institutions and their audiences. Before Alexandra starts, I would like to ask you to leave your questions in the comments section, uh, and I will read them out loud during the Q&A after the keynote. And now, Alexandra, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, before I will share my screen to share my slide with you, I wanted to say that I'm very grateful and happy and honored to be here with you today and start this lovely morning uh, with you. And I wanted to thank you, uh, thanks to, to the organizers for having me here with you today. And I, from what I know from the program, this will be a very exciting uh, event. So I'm even more happy that I can kickstart it with you uh, now. So now let me just uh, share my screen um, and uh, I will start with my presentation. I hope it is now visible to you. Um, uh, so my uh, today's lecture is entitled Towards the Post-Pandemic Future. And it's all about imagining new realities of cultural uh, institutions. And maybe I'll tell you very briefly why I decided to focus on institutions. I'm equally interested in freelance cultural managers, cultural professionals, heritage professionals. But I do think then, and I believe that in this ecosystem, institutions are crucial for all of these actors to actually be able to do their job because for freelancers, they're, they're an amazing and resourceful uh, actors that can support their work. And for uh, for other um, cultural managers, for example, uh, and other heritage professionals, they are crucial hubs that kind of like gather us all together. So I think they're like crucial pillars of the whole cultural sectors. So the, so the fact that I'm talking about the future of cultural heritage institutions or arts and cultural institutions doesn't mean I'm, I do not care about all the other actors that are within the sector. I do care and I think institutions are crucial for the mm, new realities and new future of us all in the cultural and arts sector. And uh, as, um, as it was already mentioned, I uh, in my daily work, I work at Centrum Cisrova and this is at Think and Do Tank based in Warsaw, Poland, and we are interested in how technology influences different dimensions of our lives. In particular, we're interested in how technology influences culture and arts, education and public policies. Uh, so today I will be focusing on the arts and cultural um, uh, sector. And um, uh, before we start imagining new futures, I also wanted to, um, for us to stop for a moment and think about what we have been through. And uh, I don't know how uh, it now works in all the places that you are at, but like definitely here in Warsaw, in Poland, we kind of feel that the, another wave of pandemic is sort of over. But obviously what we have learned during this last month is that uh, we can't be sure. And we already have been through some really intense and uh, challenging time that affected us all. And I think uh, affected arts and cultural professionals in many uh, profound ways especially those who are freelancers or those who are uh, who are not working in the institutions like permanently. So I, I think it is important for us to make sense of, of um, what uh, has been happening and also see in what ways this can be lessons for a lesson for us. Because I do believe that crisis is a good moment to stop and reflect and invent new ways of operating. And I will be encouraging you all to do so with me uh, today. So uh, going deeply into this making sense phase of my talk, uh, 
Uh, I was um, uh, following different research uh, projects that uh, have been happening in the sector. And uh, as you probably all know, and probably there are more research projects done than I can and I'm able to follow. But as you know, like many institutions were looking uh, during the first and second and third lockdown, many institutions were looking into how this uh, new crisis, this pandemic crisis will impact cultural and arts sector. And uh, here I'm just um, quoting and showing uh, just a few research projects that uh, have been done. Uh, NEMO, the Network of European Museum Organizations, uh, was doing research about European uh, institutions, cultural heritage institutions, museums in particular. Um, uh, ICOM, so International Council for Museums, was also looking at the global impact of the pandemic and uh, on the museum sector. But there were also other analysis, like um, like the Pierre Louis de Sac analysis of uh, the shock that COVID uh, brought about and how this shock affects um, the cultural and creative sectors and how we can actually cope with that uh, impact. Um, uh, I'm showing a lot of uh, um, um, mentions here about museums, but this is, these are not the only institutions that are like operating in the cultural field. However, we can look at them and they were like heavily researched to see what the impact that was documented actually uh, was and what does it mean for us. And I think it is, uh, it is good to look for uh, at and it was, uh, <clears throat> it was, I think, in the uh, in the first uh, pandemic spring that this result appeared, uh, saying that almost all museums around the world will reduce their activities because of the consequences of COVID, and that we already know because we all experienced that. Uh, and nearly one third of them will reduce staff. So this is already some <clears throat> very uh, important, but also very serious. Um, uh, prediction that was made in the spring 2020 that many cultural heritage institutions and museums in particular because that was the object of the study were expecting that they will have to reduce staff uh, because of the impact of the pandemic and uh, what is even more striking that in the global perspective uh, more than one tenth might be forced to close permanently. And we are speaking about closing permanently the entire institutions in certain parts of the world. So we can also already see uh, how serious, even at the very beginning, this impact um, could have been. And uh, what is uh, also important is that almost all museums, like a great majority of, of respondents, anticipated that the programs will be reduced and 30%, uh, almost 30% expect that, that the number of staff will have to be reduced. And um, uh, 20, uh, over 12% um, expected that they, they resume might close. I hope this, uh, this didn't happen. We don't have the data yet. So we don't know how many institutions actually suffered that badly. But like we can see uh, in this, uh, uh, on this slide how serious the global impact of this uh, crisis was for many institutions in different parts of the world. And uh, what is also very important is that the situation for free freelance professionals was alarming and just like during the spring 2020. And some of them were temporarily laid off and some did not have their contracts renewed. So we we know already, and I'm sure you know that from your uh, professional circles, your colleagues, that the uh, the effect that this crisis had on cultural professionals who are like working on the freelance basis was really heavy. And we learned that the freelance sector is very fragile. Um, and uh, this is something that we have to think about and we have to take into consideration while thinking about how and what we want to change for the future. Um, so this is something that I think is very important for us to like bear in our minds. And another thing that I think is also something that uh, we have to remember is that most museum professionals and most, like, most cultural heritage professionals, including artists, um, cultural managers, uh, curators, uh, were working remotely during this period. And uh, in this research done by ICOM, 84% of um, all the respondents said that 
uh, their staff is working remotely during lockdown. And we know that from the uh, research uh, study we conducted at Centrum Cyfrowe in Poland, that for many cultural heritage professionals, it was the first time in their entire professional life when um, they were working remotely. And that obviously opens up some enormous potential because uh, we know from our research that uh, some of the cultural heritage professionals would like that to stay with them. They don't want to go back to the offices on the permanent basis. They do want to work remotely and, uh, and in this most, most, more flexible and agile ways. However, we also need to remember that this, this created many challenges uh, for many people who were forced to work remotely and they maybe not necessarily had, per, had perfect um, uh, conditions to do that. And obviously we do need to remember about the, uh, the gender gaps. We, uh, we also know from the research studies that were conducted during this period then that in many cases, uh, women are p primary caregivers uh, still. And for some of them, this working remotely was a, an even greater a burden. So we need to also remember about uh, that the fact that working remotely was for many people a new thing. And I think many people and many probably of you uh, are excited about this perspective of this staying with us. Uh, but I think we need to also remember about those who might not be perfectly fitted or equipped to actually continue working remotely. And while envisioning this new post-pandemic future, we do need to think about like how to make this more flexible, more, uh, more agile ways of working accessible to different cultural heritage um, professionals, to artists and curators. Uh, who might face some challenges working remotely. But what is also like amazingly important <clears throat> in this conversation is the fact that apart from all the challenges that the pandemic has brought about, like this challenging of like not being in touch with your audiences, not being able to exhibit your work in physical spaces, or not being able to actually go further with the activities that were planned, not being able to actually go further with the programs that, that you probably had in mind before the pandemic and wanted to, uh, to move forward. We also have observed an amazing creativity boost. And uh, probably you all remember different, um, different versions of this creativity boost. People singing together on Zoom or people creating artwork together online people sharing um, their artworks uh, online or streaming what they uh, are trying to, to do at home or in the studios online, sharing all sorts of cultural um, activities and ideas. This is something that we experienced in like many uh, profound and amazing ways. And we also have seen how much the digital tools and digital platforms that we have access to were a great enabler of that um, sharing and collectiveness happening. We also have seen many uh, amazing encounters. For example, cultural heritage professionals, I know that happened in Poland and uh, at least some other countries in Europe, cultural heritage professionals were um, connecting with teachers to help teachers use the cultural and art resources in their remote teaching. And there were many such encounters and such um, voluntary attempts of um, helping each other. And I think this is also an experience that we not, not only have to remember, but actually we need to find ways for that to continue in a sustainable way, in a way that is possible. Uh, also after the, this like crisis is gone, because we know that from history, that crises and pandemic, uh, the global pandemic of COVID-19 is one of them, that crises are um, uh, great excuses to actually stop and uh, do things that we normally do not do and be uh, generous in helping others. But uh, we need to also think how this sharing and this openness and this, this, this sense of collectiveness can stay with us in a sustainable way, in a way that is not uh, created by, by an emergency, but in a way that we can facilitate 
um, for the whole cultural sector to benefit from it. Because I think this was something that uh, that not only um, uh, made us see how uh, how amazingly creative uh, these sectors are, but also shown, uh, has shown us many different ways in which uh, we can make new connections between different actors uh, in the field of art a culture and creativity and probably you all have your own uh, favorite experiences of this like uh, boost of creativity online but i wonder if you also share this observation with me that uh, during the first uh, pandemic lockdown we observed this like this amazing wave of digital culture being shared um, online and then like after that i think uh, there was a moment where probably there were there was more di the digital online culture than we were able to consume even, um, and I think after that like first pick we also observed some uh, some changing expectations of audiences, and what I know from the research um, projects conducted is that after this like first creativity boost when people were sharing whatever they were willing to share, we also uh, noticed that the um, audiences are getting used to that and their their expectations are changing. And many um, arts and cultural professionals uh, say that after that first wave in the spring of, of 2020, they observed that the audiences um, after that uh, are more picky and also expect uh, maybe better quality uh, or maybe better prepared works that were uh, in comparison to those that we were sharing and observing in this first wave. And I think this is also something that we need to remember about, that uh, with this amount of digital culture that was accessible in digital arts, uh, the experiences uh, of our audiences also shape their expectations. And these expectations are changing really quickly, and I will come back to that uh, in a minute. <clears throat> what we have also seen is that uh, many um, cultural heritage professionals, artists, curators, institutions took a crash course in digital transformation because not everybody, not every institution, not every person was prepared to actually uh, go absolutely and completely online with all their activities. And um, this is <clears throat> this funny image is probably something that you have all experienced. So we all experienced um, the virtual meeting being basically a modern science. Uh, and we have all been learning a lot, learning new tools, uh, acquiring new competences and new knowledge, experimenting with uh, new formats, uh, new ideas. And uh, this crash course in digital transformation was really important because many uh, institutions, but also many professionals, were forced to uh, start learning new tools and new, um, new solutions, new virtual formats, new online formats very quickly. And this, I think, is, although it was probably uncomfortable for many people, this, uh, I think, is a very fruitful and a, and a very uh, important process. However, we need to also remember about the fact that some of us were much better prepared for that crash course in digital transformation than the others. For example, we know that, again, from a research project, that many institutions were much better equipped with um, the IT support, with the competences, with the infrastructure than others. And we do have to remember about that, that we should now focus on like distributing that more equally. So we want all the institutions and all the cultural heritage professionals to have equal chances in this new um, uh, digital future. So we need to remember uh, about the fact that um, although this crash course in digital transformation was taken almost by everybody, some of the, the institutions and some of the people uh, uh, were less privileged than the others. And we need to remember about like distributing this, uh, this knowledge, skills, and access to certain tools and access to, to knowledge and competences more equally so that uh, we can go beyond this strange virtual meeting, meetings being CMSS and actually focus on like more innovative uh, tools and ways in which we can connect with, with each other 
and with our uh, new digital audiences. <clears throat> And I think this is also uh, this is also uh, a funny thing. We are talking a lot about digital transformation, uh, and I think um, it actually uh, works as a transition for many uh, uh, cultural heritage professionals. And uh, I think it will. It, uh, there is a chance that it will change the whole cultural sector for good, because for many institutions and many cultural heritage professionals, this was the first time they actually. Experienced the the potential that the digital can bring about, and also uh, they discovered new ways of like interacting with their audiences, uh, disseminating their work, or uh, um, sharing and learning uh, through these digital encounters. And I hope this this can be something that transforms us for good. And, uh, and I also think that uh, it, we can call it digital transformation, but we can also think and call it digital transition if you want to focus on this like more sustainable, more process oriented uh, way of uh, us all actually uh, getting used to uh, these new digital um, dimensions of our work, but also like making sure that what we have learned will stay with us also after um, after the pandemic is gone which we hope uh, all hope will happen uh, very soon and this is an, again uh, some data um, many museums this is again the icon study uh, and actually enhance their digital activities and this is probably something we all know but what i think is interesting that um, what the what we have experienced and what we have observed uh, is that the digital communication activities uh, increased during this period. And in particular, that were social media activities that will increase more than half um, in more than half institution studies. So we also see that the, the, the existing platforms were a huge um, uh, resource that institutions and artists were using in the first place. Not that not so much the tools that maybe they had, like their website or other uh, other online tools, but the platforms that gather audiences. And I will come back to that in a moment. So I think after all that, all that we have experienced, and after making sense of what that might mean, we do need to reflect on like what comes next, because this new normal or this like new post-pandemic future uh, is uh, is almost here and we need to really think about what can what are we making of the experience that we just had and um, where do we go from here because what we definitely discovered are new formats and new formats of um, events new formats of um, exhibitions of uh, events cultural events and exchanges but we also discovered new audiences with um, taking your activities online, probably all of you know that we discovered new audiences that are out there. Uh, we also discovered new institutional practices. Working remotely was for many of us a great way of learning new institutional practices. We came up with new ideas and we also um, created new partnerships. And this is something that uh, we need to continue and we need to really um, grasp and make sure we understand how these new um, things that uh, the crisis brought about can stay with us. So the crucial question is, where do we go from here? Because uh, we have all these new things that we experimented with, uh, we've learned many things, uh, we discovered many things, and how do we envision this new uh, future for the cultural sector? So. First of all, I think what we need to think about is that uh, crisis is, all, as I mentioned already, a great moment for us to stop and rethink. But we also need to make sure that we overcome the crisis of imagination. Because uh, sometimes when we think of the things that are possible, we can't imagine things that are radically different from the things we already do. So I think this is very crucial that in this moment, we also make sure that the things that we experimented with that maybe were outside of our everyday realm of working or outside even of our comfort zone. Some of these uh, things might um, help us imagine the new future of the cultural heritage sector. 
And this imagining the future uh, requires um, us to think strategically because uh, during this last pandemic months, we were thinking very much like in direct response to the reality that was around us. So we were thinking about oh, what we can do now that can that can respond to this crisis, how we can now communicate with the audiences that can't come to our institutions, how we can now exhibit our works that we can't show in a gallery space, for example. But now when this thing is kind of slowly um, over, we and slowly behind us, we need to think strategically and we need to engage in like long-term strategic thinking to actually make sure that what we have learned and experienced stay with us. And this strategic thinking it does not only have to be long term, so like we need this like long term vision, but it also has to be bold. It has to be brave, so that we can imagine uh, different futures, different than uh, than the ones we were imagining before the crisis. And I think these futures have have to be digital futures because we can't undo the experience that uh, and that we already went through. And I think we need to make sure that we focus on how these digital futures can benefit not only our institutions, not only artists and cultural professionals, but also our audiences. And when it comes to audiences, I think this is very important to note that audiences are changing and so are their needs and practices of using and participating in culture. And they are changing, they were changing even before the pandemic. But definitely this, this experience changed their expectations, their needs. And as we were learning and as cultural heritage professionals, they were learning as well. And they were experimenting as well. And their expectations and their, their ways in which they use culture are completely different than they used to be. So we need to bear that uh, in the back of our heads. But this process of like audiences changing and experimenting with the digital, it's not new. And pandemic definitely, the pandemic definitely catalyzed it, but it started even it it started even earlier. And this is a, a study that was uh, conducted in 2008 in the U.S. And what is interesting is that uh, back then they noticed that this was a study done by the National Endowment for the Arts that the audiences used the digital in many ways to participate in culture and youth culture but they noticed a drop uh, in um, audiences attending museum exhibits and performances. Uh, so we saw that this digital dimension created new platforms for participating in culture. And at, uh, in 2008, we observed that maybe institutions were not ready yet to meet the new demands and new expectations of audiences. And I think this has changed and we need, need to now observe what our audiences are now uh, expecting. And I think that this is also important that when we think about the cultural, the, the cultural sector uh, entering this digital culture, entering the digital, we also need to think about the, the other different things that people do online. So I think it's important to remember that, uh, and this is a, a funny quote from the uh, the former Met, uh, so Metropol Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York chief digital officer. He said, well, when we enter the digital, uh, our competition as Met, as a modern art museum, is not another great museum. Our competition is Netflix because what we are competing for is the, the time and attention of our audiences online. And our audiences online are not only looking for um, arts and culture in a traditional sense, but they are also spending time participating in culture in many ways. And I think this is crucial to acknowledge that rather than fighting these new ways of participating in culture, we need to acknowledge that these services are the new culture. And we are part of this huge um, huge digital uh, culture community. And I think observing the audiences and, um, and observing how their needs are changing is a very important uh, thing that we should be mindful of and that we should um, uh, pay attention to. Uh, and this, because this might also inspire us to experiment with new formats, but also like this can inspire us uh, to create new relationships with new audiences. And I think there is a powerful, the, the, this is a, a well-known and powerful sentence, go where your audience is. 
And I think this uh, pandemic uh, month has taught us that this is, um, this is a great strategy to look for our audiences in these places online where they already are instead of waiting for them to come to our website or to use our digital tool. And I think this is exactly the reason for which uh, many institutions were using social media platforms to actually get in touch with the audiences because that's exactly where different group audience groups are. But we need to also make sure that we are not leaving people behind and especially as institutions that are mission driven. Uh, I think we need to make sure that uh, this like excitement about new audiences and new potential does not um, uh, create this um, this situation where we leave some audiences who are maybe not that uh, media literate, who are maybe not uh, who maybe do not have such um, um, such great uh, digital competences that we are not leaving them behind because uh, they have the right to participate in culture and benefit from culture. And we need to also think creatively about the ways in which we can also stay in touch with these audiences that might not that might need our help to actually adjust to these new realities. And I think there were some digital tools that uh, that are inspiring for uh, for us. And one of them, and actually the two that we can see here are the digital tools that are doing exactly that, that they are uh, uh, going to the audiences in places where the audiences already are. The New York Public Library in Sanovas is a project from before the pandemic, but I think it's it's a perfect way of like catching the audience's attention in, uh, in, a, uh, in a platform where they already are. This is a project, maybe you know um, this project, this is a project of um, uh, literary classics being translated into uh, Insta stories uh, in, in this Insta novel format that the New York Public Library has invented. So it catches the audience's attention exactly when they are scrolling Instagram, for example, on their way to work or just eating lunch. I think this is a, a great example of like how go where your audiences might work. But we also have seen, and pandemic also catalyzed that, different uh, new ideas um, of how we can use social media platforms for storytelling. And so this, uh, this um, image in the bottom right is actually an uh, Instagram series created for the platform uh, that was uh, created by a, a new media um, a collective, uh, the Kissinger Twins. And actually, the whole storytelling, the whole story that was part of this new series was developing on Instagram itself and was growing on Instagram itself. And I think these are interesting ways in which we can connect with our audiences easily uh, going to where they already are. But obviously, uh, the digital offers uh, enormous potential. And you will see many cases uh, during this event so I'm not going to go too deeply into examples, but except for this like simple and quick tools that are going where the audiences are, there are also this enormous marvelous project that uh, uh, allows you to dive into arts and culture in a very, uh, very exciting ways, like the Garden of Earthly Delights. That was um, that is actually a great digital online experience of one painting, and you can zoom in and you can um, discover this painting in many uh, in many uh, dimensions. And also, like we all love Rijksmuseum, Rijksmuseum because of what they did with their with their online collection, because they provided open access to almost all works in their collection a uh, long time ago. And I think this is also something that we still have to remember about and we still have to care about to actually provide access to our cultural resources with the use of digital tools. And we can also experiment with these tools in ways that we could could have not imagined before. And I think this, um, this project, uh, the next Rembrandt, maybe you know of, is one of the examples showing us um, how powerful tools we already have, because this is um, this is the new, let's say, the new, the next Rembrandt uh, created uh, with the use of the artificial intelligence and computer algorithms. And uh, I think this is another way in which we can think about what we can do with the digital tools we already have. 
And but I want us to remember that these digital tools have enormous potential, but we can remember about the fact that we should focus on them being open and accessible to everyone. Because uh, the potential of technology is great and we can think of many different ways in which we can use them to benefit culture and art. But we need to also remember about that, that we um, need to make sure that uh, our audiences and our different group of audiences can actually openly access and use uh, this potential with us. Um, so that we are not leaving anybody behind, as I mentioned before. And also I want to mention institutional change. I think uh, it's difficult to ignore what is happening all over the world with museums and other institutions being challenged to change their practices and to change the way they operate. And we have been observing this change that from knowledge gatekeepers uh, institutions, cultural heritage institutions, are more and more becoming community enablers. From provided, providing access to a selected few, we see the change towards being accessible to everyone, and the digital can revolutionize and facilitate that in many profound ways. From creating knowledge, we see the, that we are turning to helping others to create and even more to deconstruct knowledge. And from cultural heritage institutions as consumers of technology, we now see that institutions can be research and development labs and can be co-designers of innovation. And I think this is something that we have to, um, that we have to keep in mind, that this institutional change is crucial for us to actually benefit from the potential of technology um, uh, in, a, in a most efficient way. So uh, the cultural and art institutions uh, are now, and we observe that, that shift, not only past, but also future oriented. And I do believe that they can help us confront contemporary challenges. And this is something that maybe traditionally cultural sector was not that much ready and eager to do because many cultural heritage institutions, many uh, traditional art institutions, we're thinking that they are in the forever business. They are ca taking care for the heritage, for the arts, for something that was already created. And now we see more and more that these institutions can be great platforms for us to, to have dialogue and conversations about contemporary challenges and about our future. And I think one of the great challenges that both the digital and the cultural can help us um, deal with is the climate crisis. And uh, I have a great pleasure um, of being part of the Climate for Culture um, um, and, um, and the Museums for Climate Initiative. And I think uh, museums, with uh, the digital tools they have and with the old knowledge, experience and creativity they have, they can be great platforms for debating and helping people face um, the challenge of the climate crisis. And we see many initiatives uh, happening within the sector that are uh, aimed at um, facing the, the climate crisis. One of them is museum facing extinction, uh, extinction, another one is culture for climate, but there are many, many more that connect, uh, that use the text to connect, discuss, and invent uh, different ways in which we can confront this challenge. But I think we uh, we can also uh, remember that we have to also remember that uh, in cultural heritage institutions, cultural art institutions, artists, curators are a great community to actually facilitate digital transformation in a way that is mission driven, that has common good creativity, arts and culture at the center. Because we see that a lot of the discourse around technology, like public discourse around technology, is very much focused on income and commercial uses of technology. And I think what cultural and heritage and arts sector has to offer is uh, to shift this discussion, to shift this debate and shift the perspective so that we can think of digital transformation with the common good creativity, arts and culture at the center of this debate. And as William Gibson uh, said, future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. And I think this is also something that um, arts and culture can help us with um, to uh, think of the future ways of using the, the digital tools and digital potential that we already have, but also like focusing on how we can do it with this common good, vision of common good 
at the center so that it can be uh, distributed more evenly. And um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that cultural and arts institutions and cultural heritage professionals and arts professionals are great um, uh, are in a great place to use technology to enable the well-being of communities. And we saw that during the pandemic, how much uh, culture and the arts was helping people to cope with the difficulties of this experience. And even before the pandemic, um, we saw examples like this one that you see on my slides, that uh, some museums started uh, prescribing, uh, partnering with doctors and prescribing art to people. And I think this is uh, a great potential of art that now can be scaled up with um, with the help of technology and the pandemic already shown us how we can do it to actually enable the well-being of our community and another thing is that cultural and arts sector can also show the the rest of the uh, of the world how to use technology to lead purpose-driven, human-centered innovation. So as mission-driven institutions and as mission-driven professionals, we can think of ways in which we can create innovation that is mission-driven as well, that has this, let's say, well-being of communities or boosting creativity or, um, or helping us to cope with different challenges at the center of the discussion about how we can innovate. And I think institutions, because they are Often publicly funded because they have this whole they have these whole collections of human creativity. They can serve as a perfect platform for um, for such innovation to happen. And uh, last but not least, I think what uh, it also is also very important is that uh, public institutions, arts and cultural institutions, can help us reclaim digital public spaces because we have learned recently that we need safe public spaces online where we can debate, where we can be creative together, where we can exchange. And uh, um, cultural heritage and arts institutions have always been these third spaces. So the spaces that are somehow between private and public, the spaces where encounters happen. And I think like merging with the potential of the digital and cultural uh, and arts institutions can invent new ways of uh, creating and sustaining digital public spaces where we can exchange, um, discuss, and think together about um, about arts, about culture, but also about our future as societies. And what I also think is very important is that um, the collection, the potential, the creativity that cultural and creative sectors uh, have can uh, can be crucial in unlocking this potential of creativity to help us imagine collective futures. And this is also something that um, that I think uh, we can see uh, already in history that um, artists, architects, creatives, designers, uh, cultural and heritage experts have a lot of knowledge that can help us imagine different futures that we want to see for us as societies and uh, these ages of human creativity that uh, that are stored in for example museum storage rooms or uh, um, arts collection is something that can inspire us uh, to think about these new collective future and uh, the digital can play a crucial role in that because uh, the digital can help us connect in the ways that were not possible before. And I think with this experience of the global pandemic that is, I hope, almost behind us, we have learned that connecting with unusual suspects, with unusual partners, with uh, institution was easier when we discovered that we can only work um, online and we found new ways of uh, creating collective, creating partnerships and working together. And I think this is something that we should find ways to continue so that we can still facilitate as a cultural sector, facilitate these encounters and, um, and help us as a society unlock these ages of human creativity to help us imagine collective futures, because this is something that we do need, uh, uh, need a lot uh, in these days. And, and um, 
I think this is a way in which we can overcome the so-called crisis of imagination. And um, uh, I'm quoting a, a wise man here who said that the most important thing in the world is be, to be willing to give up who you are for who you might become. And this is often said that there is this tension between belonging and becoming. That belonging, uh, this is these are the old ways of doing things, the old ways of operating, the old ways uh, that we are used to. That we somehow need to give up to actually focus more on what, what, and where we want to be. And there is definitely this tension and this axis between the two. But I, uh, I will be brave enough to disagree with the, with the uh, wisdom master that I just quoted. And I think we don't need to completely give up the old ways. We don't need to completely give up who we were. And I think cultural uh, and art sector are perfect uh, enablers of such uh, change because on one hand, they are in the belonging business. Institutions are in the forever business. They were focused on like, collecting and presenting and and dealing with uh, ages of creativity. But I think they're also now very eager to look towards the future. And I think that, that maybe because of that, they're a um, perfect type of uh, actors that can actually help us negotiate the two, the two uh, different ends of the spectrum uh, and actually focus on what what we need to be like, what we need from the belonging side to actually be able to become what we want to become as a society, but also as a sector. Um, and I think uh, this is uh, the thought that I want, would like to leave you with. Uh, I do feel that institutions, cultural heritage and arts institutions can become a research and development lab where we invented new ways of not only uh, participating in culture, connecting with our audiences and experimenting with human creativity, but also new ways in which we can think of the future of our society. And um, I wish you a very fruitful uh, uh, time and discussions here. And I will be happy to take your questions if you have some. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And yes, it is time for our Q&A session. So I see one question actually in our comments section, but yes, I would like to remind everybody who joined us a little bit later that you are welcome to uh, post your questions to Alexandra uh, in the uh, comments section, which is to the right uh, from, uh, from the screen. Uh, and uh, we have a question from Anastasia Yevseyeva. So how could you assess the response of the Polish government to the pandemic in terms of the culture and creative industries sector? Um, thank you, that's a great question. So when it comes to uh, to the response of our government, I think what we were struggling with is that the experts very much focused on like providing cultural and creative sector with new funding opportunities. But this fund, these funding opportunities were project based, and I think this was a challenge for some people. Our uh, very soon during the pandemic, uh, our heritage program uh, was called uh, a cultural line, Kultura w Sieci. It was a program that was aimed at supporting cultural heritage professionals, institutions, and geos. Um, in uh, doing online projects that are more suited for the pandemic. But then like a lot of people were struggling with the fact that this is a support that is project-based, so that you needed to have an idea, apply for the, for the project and might not be selected as well. But after that, the, the government also provided some funding just for, to support people without the need to, uh, to apply for any special project. So like the, the funding support to actually sustain their activities. But like overall, I think uh, what we need to think about and what we've learned during the pandemic, uh, and I think this is the, the case of Poland, is that um, while institutions and some more like officially organized entities were able to cope, the, the ones who suffered the most were freelancers. Freelancers as artists, cultural heritage professionals, 
um, cultural activists, cultural managers. And for them, it was much more difficult to get the support as they are not, some of them are not officially registered uh, as having like, their own businesses. So it was, uh, it was very difficult for them. And I think this is a great and painful lesson that we learned from the pandemic, that this is the group that is usually in the most precarious conditions. And these precarious conditions were even strengthened by the experience of the pandemic. And I think this is a global problem. I mean, this was a problem in Poland, but I think this is a global problem that we usually tend to forget about those who uh, are just like freelancing or don't have permanent contracts or are not like businesses or they are not uh, doing their own commercial activities as businesses, but as private people. And I think the challenge is that these people and these like collectives are like the, the ones that m most easily disappear from the perspective of official institutions. And I think that's, that's something that we have to really work on in the future. Um, and I, I know that the, in the Polish cultural heritage sector, coming back to the question, uh, is that um, there was a lot of research being done about how the cultural heritage sector was coping. And I know that the theater and performance arts, arts sector has done a lot, a lot of research uh, around how the Polish um, sector was coping. And they have uh, some uh, very interesting uh, reports from this research that show exactly that um, institutions were able to cope somehow, but like the, the, the individual people were, were mm, uh, and, uh, affected in many ways. Okay, thank you. And I would like to actually, uh, in connection to what you said about the uh, uh, freelancers, um, I think in, in a way, uh, many of us uh, have become much more like freelancers during this year uh, because uh, the working remotely uh, is really kind of reminiscent of uh, you know when you are uh, on your own and uh, well within our institution for example in the ukrainian institute um, there has been this discussion around whether we should uh, you know get back to working physically in the office after the pandemic is over and it seems that to many people uh, working uh, remotely is really more comfortable in in many ways uh, and so so uh, it's it's clear that for many people uh, there are uh, certainly uh, the uh, advantages of uh, working uh, remotely. Uh, but then at the same time, there is this uh, basically a, a problem of um, you know work and leisure time balance, which has been present in the in every freelancer's uh, life uh, for a long time because when you when you don't have a place to work you work from your home office or i don't know from a cafe it's sometimes really uh, hard to switch from uh, between the modes and it really well uh, i i guess i have read some um, research about that uh, the result of that is that people get more tired and uh, exhausted uh, because of that, uh, you know, blurred uh, boundaries between uh, work and and your leisure time. So uh, what is your personal take on this? So um, I, it's clear that many of us will prefer to stay at home now, uh, but wh how, how, like what advantages and what drawbacks do you personally see in this new uh, lifestyle? Yeah, thank you. I think you're absolutely right. And I think this is something that we need to learn how to use for our advantage, not for our disadvantage. Because our research in Poland, when it comes to Polish cultural professionals, has shown that most of them want to stay at home working remotely. So they want to stay uh, at home at least for like um, a significant part of the week um, after the lockdown. So we see that this is something that is here to stay. But uh, I also uh, noticed that many of the people, because the, the conditions that we have for working remotely is one challenge. Not everybody has equally good conditions. And we also know that if you have children at home, especially educate, like um, during the remote education, this can be even more challenging. And um, the another thing is that we do need to think of 
how as, um, as employers, we can support our employees in working remotely. And I think this is something that uh, we as employers should be responsible of to actually make sure that we give them enough tools and support so that they can work remotely in a very comfortable uh, way. And I think there is also the challenge that you've mentioned with blurring boundaries between leisure time and like, private time and, and working time. And most of the cultural heritage professionals that we interviewed uh, said that they work more. And this is something that is like coming back in every research I read. And this is actually something that we need to learn how not to do. I mean, we, we need to uh, learn how to have this like more fixed working hours when working remotely. And I think, again, this shouldn't be only the responsibility of, uh, of the employees. Uh, it should be also if you if we think not about freelancers but about like people employed in institutions. I think this should be also the uh, responsibility of the employer that um, that the institution creates very clear um, <clears throat> rules or regulations on like that you are not expected to actually uh, work in different hours hours only because of the fact that you work um, remotely. But I also, um, in our research, there was also one thing that I think is very important that came up, that uh, although many uh, uh, cultural and arts professionals were working remotely, they uh, say that they do not have enough tools to actually make most of this like uh, potential of working remotely. And for many said that, well, in our institutions or in our team, uh, there were no like new digital tools introduced except for video conferencing. So the tools that they were using were basically video conferencing and phones, basically, without, for example, tools to manage your tasks, without the tools that help you manage your projects, without the tools for communication uh, for teams online. And I think this is something that uh, has to change. I mean, if we want people to work remotely and like really like enter this new digital era, we need to make sure that they are equipped with tools because these tools are there and they can help you basically. And this is nothing new because the, for example, the, the IT companies were working remotely for ages already. And uh, actually they were using these tools. So the tools are there. But many uh, cultural and arts heritage professionals do not know these tools, and this is perfectly fine because they, you know, like they, they didn't have a chance to actually uh, come across these tools. But now we have to make sure that we do help people make most of working remotely. So yeah, like time, um, uh, private time, and like work time, work life balance the tools for working remotely, not only video conferencing, but also other tools that help you manage uh, the way you work and responsibility of employers, I think is very important so that we create uh, uh, decent conditions for people to work remotely. Yeah, so hopefully this new situation uh, will really lead to institutions thinking a, a bit more about how they can create uh, a good environment for their employees to work remotely and this is something that has basically never happened before unless you were in the IT sector so this is really I guess the the main thing that we should focus on uh, yeah thank you uh, and I also have a question uh, based on your uh, based on your own research on the things that you have read um, this might be a very a little bit tricky question, but I'm really interested in your uh, insights. Uh, so, what aspects actually of the of the culture sector of the art sector, uh, in your opinion, have been most affected uh, by the pandemic? So, I we we know the figures. We understand people could not attend uh, the places physically, which really resulted in that many programs, many exhibitions, and other events could not simply take place uh, but are there any like less obvious things uh, which you think have been affected and we don't uh, talk about them enough uh, yeah I think this is a difficult question but uh, I think what uh, what we are kind of missing I think is like because there are some obvious things that for example performance art were like heavily affected because most, many performances basically can't be transferred online or it's very difficult to, to, to transfer them online. 
or I think um, many like musicians and th this type of like um, businesses institutions were heavily affected. But what I also think is that we kind of also do not talk enough about the fact that because of this like boost of creativity online, our audiences got used to the fact that a lot of the culture is for free. I mean, that a lot of cultural activities can be attended just without like paying for them because this is online. So this is like accessible for free. And there is nothing wrong with that. That was that, that was what was happening during the pandemic. But I think for many performers who were like seeking ways to attract audiences online, this is a challenge because uh, now people somehow got used to the fact that these online cultural activities are not, um, that they're accessible, they're, they're for free. And now they are, they might not be willing to pay again for such, um, for such activities. And I think this is crucial that we find ways to deal with that because this is for the, for the, for these artists, this is a source of income. And I think this is something that we need to find ways to figure out so that, um, uh, so that these, uh, performers can actually make their living and sustain, um, their lives with the use of this income uh, even if they perform online because this is still work and i think this is this is something that we need to find ways to deal with and i also think when it comes to what who was affected and in what ways i think there are um, uh, there are groups that we tend to think less about and for example i think that a cultural and heritage institutions were important places for uh, for elderly people because this is a place where they come to interact with each other, not not only to just, you know, like um, see the exhibition, but also to meet and interact with each other. And I think this is a group that was somehow left behind because these are people who are very often digitally excluded. Uh, so the, there were no, um, not many um, cultural activities happening during the pandemic targeted at them. And I, what I'm afraid of is that they will be left uh, behind for good that we are now excited about this new audiences we have these new audiences and that this group might be might not just come back as an important group uh, for certain cultural or arts institutions and I think this this should not be this should not be the case and uh, I also know that there are some sectors that um, I think are operated like uh, on a on a small scale. Like for example, I know that some performance and actors from, uh, let's say, some smaller theater companies are the ones who are really affected, and they are now looking. Or like for example, dancers or like visual artists experimenting with performance. And I think this is something that we need to find ways to like bringing back to the institutions. And I have an interesting example of how that can be done. Uh, in the Museum of the History of Polish Jews uh, in Warsaw, uh, during the lockdown, uh, actually a performance project was conducted and it was a nice way to actually commission performance, performance artists to do something in the museum while the museum was closed. It was, um, it was a performance project that was happening in the, in the empty exhibition that people actually couldn't visit because of the lockdown. But the performers worked as a, as an eye for the audience and they were like playing in the exhibition space. And this was filmed uh, from different uh, cameras. So that actually people that could not come to the museum could experience this exhibition through the bodies of the performers who asked because of they were like a few of them, they could actually be in that space and explore this space with their bodies. And they are trained to do that for the audience to watch. And I think this is a of like how we um, how we work with two two different disadvantages and actually make something good out of it. So I think we should look for such ways of like engaging the the audiences and the um, and and the cultural uh, sector um, actors who are who are less uh, privileged or they were most affected uh, by the pandemic. Yeah. Thank you. I think I have one last question uh, since we are running out of time. So um, 
You mentioned new audiences that uh, appeared, uh, you know, for for the cultural institutions uh, with the online, and well, here at the Ukrainian Institute, we also try to adapt, and we have launched uh, several new programs that work with the online environment. And as you said, as you uh, quoted uh, a, um, a person from Matt about uh, the, the 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 rivals and the competition being not other museums, but rather Netflix and Candy Crush, uh, it's clear that uh, it, it has become even more uh, challenging and difficult to reach these audiences because with uh, uh, the absence of many physical experiences, people just spent um, much more time online as they used to. And of course, they will have many big corporations and uh, uh, other uh, uh, let's say companies that are specialized in working online that are a, a huge uh, uh, competition for cultural institutions and uh, i think one of the very important things in the art sector of course has always been this ability and this possibility for people to come to the event experience it uh, to meet other people. So this part, of course, is missing most uh, right now. And well, through this physical experience, uh, people used to have this, well, we could say bonding to towards the uh, institution. It was enough for a person to come there once and they could love it or they could hate it. But if they loved it, they would like to come back. And this was so natural. Of course, this is missing in, in the online communication. And so uh, my question to you would be perhaps what, um, what piece of advice, what kind of recommendations you could give to institutions working online right now uh, to create this bonding with their audiences while working online? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. And uh, you're perfectly right. And I think uh, what uh, what we need to remember about that is that as cultural heritage institutions or arts institutions, we will never be another Netflix. <laughs> and, uh, and it's and it's a good thing, <laughs> and uh, but we will never probably have these amount of resources and uh, to actually uh, to actually compete with them. But uh, but I think this is also a, we have to look at it in a way that we look uh, at our strengths and what we have in the cultural and arts sector are the amazing resources. For example, museums have amazing collections and our institutions have amazing collections. Uh, or we have skills and knowledge and visual resources that are extremely valuable online. And uh, we, we, so we, I need, I think we need to think about how we can bring these valuable resources, this, uh, these, our strengths closer to people. And I think that's why these projects that are like, go where your audience is more. Uh, so not the project that expects people to come to our website, because I think it's very difficult to create bond with anybody just through something that is just like not really interactive as websites usually are. And that's OK, because that's what they are for. I think we need to find ways to actually create these bonds with people through the platforms that they are using. And I think this is also um, more cost effective because I don't do not think that um, cultural and arts institutions should invest in technology in the first place like heavily. I think they should rather use the content, the creativity and the resources they have to use technologies that are already there and benefit from them uh, um, instead of investing in building huge infrastructures. Um, and I think we should find ways in like using the platforms that people already are using to uh, to connect with them there. And I think that that can create this bonding. And I uh, and this is one thing. So this is the first part, the first part of my answer. And the second part is that I do think that there are different um, new exciting formats of online encounters that I think are very uh, interesting and that that are worth exploring. And um, I can give you one example because uh, this is something that I was somehow like uh, involved with. Uh, a, a small festival in Krakow, Poland during the pandemic was uh, doing virtual tours um, through the city. 
but these were the virtual tours that were recorded on camera before and then uh, performed live by the guides with the video playing in the background of the site. But it was combined with the with the meeting and discussion with people that joined this event. And this was amazing because like usually it was uh, up to 30 people from different parts of the world that really like the, was, were coming uh, there to actually experience this virtual tour, but also to connect and discuss. And I think this is something that we should like look for ways of doing more and not maybe on this like very traditional video conferencing, but for example, as you are doing in this event, but uh, we can also do it uh, for the benefit of our own institutional projects that we, I think we need to leave for people to actually discuss, not only with us as an institution, but with each other using this new online uh, format. And I think this is something that we have more and more abilities to do. And this is not, not really expensive for the institutions and cultural professionals to do. And I think we should focus on such ways of creating this bond with the audiences. And the third, very quickly, the third way I would say is that we um, try to like create our activities and our uh, programs in a more participatory way so that people can also feel that they have influence. And I think this is something that it's, it's very important for creating bonds with between the audiences and the institutions. And I think like sometimes very simple things are, um, are enough. Like um, sometimes when an institution is thinking about doing a new online program, it can reach out to the people who are already participating in an online program and ask for their, um, advice or opinions or feedback and this uh, creates a very strong bond between the audience and the institution and i think it can create um, let's say advocates for the institutions out of those people and i think this is something that we also uh, need to uh, pay attention to because these people can be our multipliers uh, and they can bring more audience uh, to our virtual door so i think we we have to learn uh, how to work with them Thank you very much. Okay, so we are moving to our next session. Alexandra, thank you so much for this insightful uh, keynote. Uh, it has been very inspiring. I hope that inspired all of our participants for this uh, day of work and uh, discussion. Uh, I personally really liked uh, the idea about moving from belonging to becoming. Uh, and I totally agree with you on the fact that we perhaps shouldn't leave the belonging part altogether. Uh, and we need to find balance. So we also need to find ways uh, to work in this new uh, digital environment in a way that uh, we all have equal possibilities uh, in it. And this might be challenging, but this is a challenge we definitely need to face. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Thank you. Thank and you. Have a great day. Thank you.